So what we realized, and, and I apologize for uh, talking at an angle, but what we realize is, of course, as many people do, what presents to us in the emergency department or with the acute care provider is just the tip of the iceberg. The acute symptoms are one thing, but it's really the, the giant that is uh, hidden, so to speak, or not always clinically evident, the chronic disease that really needs to be highlighted. And we make a point of addressing that in our emergency department because we focus as acute care providers on asking questions about the severity of the disease that presents at this time. But what we also uh, drive and guide our colleagues to do in the uh, residents and our uh, fellow physicians is to ask questions about the chronic underlying disease, to ask about control uh, assessment questions, uh, asking about symptom recall over the last few weeks, to not just be uh, um, uh, impressed by the acute symptoms, but actually to get a reflection of the chronic underlying disease. And uh, so we do that with uh, a very scripted education process. We'll call it the one, two, threes of asthma. I'll, I'll emphasize on that. We do a chronic uh, asthma control classification on all our children. And we actually leave all of our children with uh, an action plan. And I'll show you we have an electronic tool for that. So our goals for our population were to make sure we provided uh, quality acute care. So of course that's what they come to the emergency department for. But we wanted to make sure that we integrated in our efforts the uh, asthma education. We wanted to make sure that we did our part on improving asthma control and also giving children the self-management tools. Now the question is why would an ER uh, be interested in managing asthma and one of the things we found is that children though we emphasize the importance of follow-up don't always get to follow up and lest we think it's a matter of bad parenting it really is not it just so happens that both my kids have asthma and we've had occasion to visit a hospital for acute symptoms and you, as you know, you spend lengthy amount of time in the emergency department or an acute care provider, and when the good person comes at the end of three or four hours and says, now in two days I want you to do this, it's not such an easy thing to do. So it's, you know, we have many obligations, either with other children or with employment or otherwise. So follow up, th and then of course, if you have the opportunity to follow up, then you have to make sure your primary care provider is available for follow up. So there are many challenges in follow up. And it turns out that other studies have been done for inner city populations that have found that less than 10% of patients actually get to follow up after an acute, in a, in a certain uh, inner city population. But the other reason we were interested is because time is on our side. When children spend three or four hours in our emergency department, that's significantly more time than they would spend with their primary care provider, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, we have respiratory therapists, nurses, physicians, all of them at the bedside. And if we better coordinated our uh, interventions, we could um, repeat, if not build on each other's educational efforts and hopefully have a better impact. But the single most important reason Oh uh, boy, was uh, a, a teachable moment. Um, you know, when asthma, as we talked about, has chronic, uh, a very large chronic component, but it's uh, hidden. It's not appreciated. It's not clinically evident. But when a child presents in the evening, as they frequently do, with severe symptoms, the family is distressed. There's quite an opportunity there to impact and make a uh, teach about uh, preventative symptoms. I frequently tell my colleagues, if my uh, cholesterol levels are high as they frequently are, you know, it, I tend to sort of uh, not pay attention, but if I have chest pain and I go to a hospital and somebody says your cholesterol high is all of a sudden a pretty good opportunity to help me realize what I need to do. And this is the angle that we take here as well. So we, we have a goal of uh, uh, an asthma program that not only delivers quality care, but also emphasizes uh, evidence-based care, education as we talked about, and is multidisciplinary in nature. Um, I'd like to talk about, uh, uh, to a fault, uh, the modalities that we use. And if anybody has heard me talk before, we in our emergency department are big fans of meter dose inhaler therapy, as I know Dr. teaches as well. We, uh, more than 80% of the children who present to our emergency department over the last six years have been treated with meter dose inhalers only. And these are children uh, very, very severe asthma who do quite well. And I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, just quickly highlighting why we see such a huge benefit to using meter dose inhalers as opposed to nebulizers. And of course, we know that asthma is a disease uh, of the intrathoracic airways, but you can see that uh, you know, the upper airways or the extrathoracic airways would be the ones that would be affected by a croup or uh, upper respiratory infection or now very rarely seen epiglottitis. 
Whereas the intrathoracic problems like bronchiolitis or asthma are problems that affect us in the chest cavity. So as we inhale, you can see that as we expand our chest cavity, we create negative pressure that transmits through the airways. And you can see why the child with croup has inspiratory st strider. So you can see that's quite uh, striking. And then, of course, the reverse is true. So you can see that the mild, moderate, or severe uh, disease is reflected by how uh, the, the auscultation of of uh, strider. But you can also see, of course, what we're interested in here is the intrathoracic problem, either bronchiolitis or asthma. Um, this is just showing what happens, the reverse happens when you exhale for an extrathoracic airway obstruction, you actually breathe much better breathing out. Exactly the reverse effect that you would have. If you breathe out and you have asthma, you further squeeze down on your airways and that's why these children wheeze when they breathe out. Uh, and the reverse is true when they breathe in. They can breathe, they expand their airways and breathe in much, much uh, easier. So hence our, our interest in uh, MDIs versus nebulizers. This is a uh, beautiful uh, graph, not mine, that demonstrates the deposition of medication by the various routes, uh, meter dose inhaler, uh, meter dose inhaler with spacer, nebulizer, or dry powder inhaler. You can see on the first graph, and the white on the bottom is really the, the area of the bar of interest, 9% of medication uh, of the albuterol would be deposited in the lungs by the meter dose inhaler route. A significant increase when you use meter dose inhalers with spacers, and we use spacers for all of our children, adolescent or otherwise. And, uh, and by the way, meter dose inhalers can be used in the infancy very effectively. We use that every day. And then, of course, nebulizers and dry powder inhalers. And what is striking about nebulizers, you can see, is the, the thick bar on the top, which is the 20% uh, exhaled medication. And I'll tell you where, where we think that comes from. So you can see that if you think of this as cycles of respiration, the first uh, bar is as you exhale, and then you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale. You see the pattern. Now, if you give somebody nebulizer medication, we, we tend to think of it, I tend to think of it as giving somebody something to drink with a water hose. You, you know, somebody comes in off the field, they're very thirsty, you turn on the water hose, and you expect them to drink continuously. And of course, we don't drink continuously, we drink in cycles, and so is with breathing. We give somebody an aerosolized medication, they're not gonna be inhaling continuously, they're gonna be inhaling in cycles. So, as we give it to them, we present the medication continuously, but the real delivery happens intermittently. So as you exhale, you don't deliver. As you inhale, you do. And you get the, you get the uh, picture here. Now the challenge, of course, the reason I showed you the, the graphs with exhalation and inhalation is asthma being a process of intrathoracic airway obstruction, you, sis, you, s you spend a significantly higher amount of time breathing out than you do breathing in. So as it turns out, when you give somebody nebulized medication, the efficiency of delivering albuterol or bronchodilator is inversely proportional to severity of disease, which is exactly the opposite of what you would think. Um, on the other hand, when we use spacers, and we always use them, uh, MDIs, when we use them with spacers, we use them with a valved chamber. The valve remains closed during exhalation, and it's unaffected by your duration of um, exhalation. So that's why we think that we can actually significantly improve outcomes with MDIs, because the, the delivery of medication is unaffected by the severity or the prolonged exhalation. So here's another reason for those who work in an ER setting or in a, in a hospital. One of the common reasons for children's admission to a hospital is hypoxia. They have low oxygen saturations and we actually get frequent calls from a pediatrician who says, you know, they've been giving albuterol and now they have oxygen saturation. We have to remember that not all that is hypoxia is related to asthma. There is this phenomenon called ventilation perfusion mismatching of course, asthma in its severe form with tightness of breathing and uh, diminished ventilation can lead to hypoxia, but that's not the only reason. So if you take a, another one of my uh, um, not so pretty graphs, if this is a picture of the, the uh, airways and the uh, arterioles, you can see that uh, when air moves and interfaces with blood, 
if you have asthma, not all of your airways are equally bronchospastic. They're not all squeezed down equally. So when you give somebody albuterol, it's gonna go down where? It's gonna go down to the area of least resistance. Now you have really dilated airways on some segments, putting pressure on the blood vessels, and hence you get a discrepancy between blood flow and oxygen delivery. And that's what people call uh, uh, VQ or ventilation perfusion mismatching. We see that all the time. And what we find is because of the lower doses of beta dose inhalers that are used as opposed to nebulizers, this discrepancy in VQ mismatch is much, much less common when you use MDIs. We have been able to, read, although our uh, actual number of asthmatics each year has risen, we, can, we have been significantly reducing since FY03 our number of children who, the percent of children who get admitted, simply by switching from nebulizers to meter dose inhalers. And that's been quite striking a result for us. We've implemented in FY06 the uh, MDI therapy in our inpatient setting, and you can see that we've reduced our length of stay significantly. And I thought I'd highlight our one, two, threes of asthma, which is you know very much similar to what everybody else is doing. Uh, uh, highlighting the inflammation and bronchospasm as separate uh, important factors, emphasizing triggers and the various ways we can affect, uh, affect their impact on us, and talking about uh, controller and as needed medications. So we do have uh, attack questionnaires that we've built in so, so families can participate in the assessment of the child's asthma. Um, we, we do uh, have an electronic form of our action plan for simplicity and streamlined use in our emergency department so we don't have a paper base so we can keep a record of it. And you can see that our action plans, since we've implemented our electronic form, has increased significantly to 80% of our asthmatics actually leaving. So the last graph I'll, I'll, sh I'll selfishly point out is that uh, tomorrow is actually my last day at the University of Maryland Hospital for Children, or Children's Hospital as it's called, and I'm starting Kindermender, which is essentially taking some of the lessons we've learned in the ER setting and saying, why don't we bring the quality access and service model more to the community? Instead of having it solely in the emergency department or hospital-based environment, we can bring it you know, what is attractive about the ER is many things, but it's access, it's ease of access, it's no appointments. So why can't we do the same thing in a community setting? So if anybody gets to visit uh, in Colombia, that's where I'll be um, day in and day out and day in and day out. So I hope to see some of you there. Thank you. That's a great question. Number one, the problem is it is completely counterintuitive. It makes no sense. So that's, it, it really is a counterintuitive phenomenon. That's why we go all through all those painful graphs because if I just told you that nebulizers are uh, not as effective than MDIs, it would make absolutely no sense. But when you sort of graph it out, when you think about the water hose model, the alternative to the water hose, which is a nebulizer in my mind, is a glass of water. A glass of water is a valved chamber that holds the water and as you, uh, as you swallow water, it delivers the water. So it is a counterintuitive process. We've been doing this at the University of Maryland for six years. And I gotta tell you, the first two years were the most painful because we had not only our uh, patients and our families to convince, but we had our colleagues to convince. I can tell you now that it is second nature. Now when somebody as a resident, a fresh resident comes in and says, we wanna give nebulizers, everybody turns around and says, why? So it is a process of getting people's habits changed. It, it does take some time. Yeah. And what do you, do you have anything in mind for how school nurses and others, caregivers, 
That's very true. So you need multiple spacers, actually. You need one spacer at the school, you need a spacer at home, you need a spacer with grandma, insurance, medical assistance, as I understand it, get, fills only one in a year's time. And there are many, many challenges, and we actually talked outside about the price and the reimbursement. The MDIs, as a provider, are significantly less, a lot more expensive, and a lot more poorly reimbursed than the nebulizers are, which makes absolutely no sense.